أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم وبسم الله الرحمن الرحيم اللهم صل وسلم وزد وبارك على رسول الله وعليه الطاهر السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته uh, Firstly, let me um, congratulate the organizers of Love Muhammad صلى الله عليه وآله وسلم for their continued work over a number of years bringing together various elements of the diverse Muslim communities the length and breadth of the UK it is a endeavor which Allah will continue to to bless and will allow us to greatly benefit from on benefit from on a continued basis let me also say congratulations to all of you for attending. I know it's cold and sometimes the warmth of our own homes are more appealing than a big hall with sometimes uh, individuals we do not know. But alhamdulillah, by the grace of Allah Azawajal, unity takes many shapes and forms and one of those shapes and forms is coming out to support a variety of events which are run throughout the year. And this is just one of them. So I'm going to divide my time uh, into three distinct uh, parts. I'm going to give you some personal narrative with regards to uh, community work conducted within um, the Caribbean and South America, attempting to bring the two communities, the two rich communities uh, of the Shia and the Sunni together. And then I'm going to turn my attention here to the uh, UK and thrash out, hopefully, a number of salient themes and then end uh, with a note of caution. And I hope the note of caution will be taken as it's meant. It's meant to be instructive. It's not meant to be divisive, but nevertheless, uh, given my experience of being here in this country, I think it needs to be said clearly. So some of my work um, takes place in South America and the Caribbean. The Muslim presence uh, in the Caribbean particularly, and the Caribbean is divided into two distinct parts. We have the West Indies and we have the little known East Indies. And much of my work takes place in the East Indies. The Muslim presence in that region has been there for hundreds of years, both apparent and hidden. In many instances, some of our communities have died out. And here I'm talking about primarily the Shia communities have died out because there have been lack of contact with the wider Shia world. Uh, the Muballighin, who are tasked with bringing the teachings of Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad to the believers unfortunately did not see those communities there falling within their remit of responsibility or were totally ignorant of them. They didn't know they existed. And so for uh, many decades there has been an erosion with regards to the Shia presence in the Caribbean. Let me give you just one example. In a country which I'm sure you're familiar with and that is uh, Jamaica, made famous by uh, Bob Marley and the now retired athlete Usain Bolt. On the day of Ashura, there were over 10,000 individuals gathered in the capital of that country commemorating the sacrifice of our Imam, salawatullahi alayhi. This is in the 19... 20s through to the 1960s. Come now the 1970s, 80s and the present day, we are fortunate that we have found one Shia in the country. Now, let me speak about the work to bring both the Shia and the Sunni communities together in the Caribbean. Again, a little known figure that the Caribbean combined 
has more individuals fighting for ISIS than the whole of Western Europe put together. This is one of our claim to fames. We have exported more men and more women and children to fight in Iraq and Syria than any Western European country. Plus, put all the Western European countries together, we have more fighters out there fighting for ISIS. So the narrative of ISIS, I would argue, is one which is not championed by events such as this. It's one which says that there is only one interpretation of Islam that is their interpretation and everybody else who works against that interpretation should be silenced. And that silence comes in many forms and the ultimate form is death. We have a huge contingent of ISIS working throughout the Caribbean, interlinked, sophisticated, well-funded, and working against the bringing together of brothers and sisters from, and I say that meaningfully, brothers and sisters, or as um, the Grand Ayatollah Ali Sistani, Dharma Barakat, mentioned, they are ourselves. Our Sunni brothers and sisters are ourselves, and I'm convinced of this. And likewise, the Grand Ayatollah Ali Khamenei, Dharma Barakat, has also championed this reality. Our Sunni brothers and sisters are ourselves, and anybody who works against that, personally, I believe they're working for shaitan. So, within the Caribbean, ISIS has taken hold of many communities, and some towns, we refer to them as ISIS towns. Our work with the small group of brothers and sisters that we have working with us is to bring the two communities together, whether it's in Grenada, Trinidad and Tobago, uh, Guyana, Haiti, and now Haiti is the new battlefield or the, the, the new line of battle which has been drawn up where hundreds of individuals from Syria and Iraq are entering into Haiti and spreading the poison amongst the Muslim communities. Our work is one where we are playing catch up. And although the situation seems bleak for us, we have had a number of stunning successes. Reaching out to leaders of communities, explaining the Shia Madhab to them, explaining the importance of inclusivity, brotherhood and sisterhood, and alhamdulillah, these Imams have stood up in their own communities and remember the Caribbean is not like England. I mean, we are able to carry firearms and certain things that can be done here cannot be done there. And many of the Sunni Imams have put their lives on risk, not only their lives, but the wives of their families at risk. They've put their lives online to counter the corrosive narrative which comes daily either via satellite, via radio, or, or within the myriad madaris which ISIS and its supporters have been able to establish in the region. So I want you uh, to remember them in your ad iyat and inshallah these individuals along with ourselves will be successful in bringing the true face of Islam back to the Caribbean, which is one of, not tolerance, but one of acceptance, one of love and compassion. Turning to the UK now, um, and I would um, second what um, the previous speaker mentioned with regards to the rise of the far right and the narrative which they are propagating. And it seems that one of the key factors in fueling the narrative is one of sexual deviance 
that Muslim men are deviant in the sense that they want to groom young white girls. That's one of the tropes, that's one of the constantly reoccurring themes which are put out there to turn a community, a non-Muslim community, which knows very little or nothing about Islam against Muslims. The other is that we are naturally oppressive to our own women. And when I say our own women, our mothers and sisters, etc. So one of sexual deviance and one of internal oppression. And these two have come together to create a grand scheme of what it means to be a Muslim man or unfortunately live in a Muslim community if you are a Muslim woman or those who want to um, raise some counter narratives to the dominant narrative which is found in Muslim communities. So what is unity? Well, I don't propose to tell you what unity actually is because I'm searching for a true meaning of unity amongst Muslims here in this country until this day. I don't know what unity actually is. I've not seen it much, let's say, within this country amongst Muslim communities. Back in the 1980s, I may have saw it where the Salman Rushdie affair was all in the news and because our interests intersected those from the Arab, those from the Asian, the Turkish, the African communities, etc., saw it a good thing to join together and utilize all our resources in countering the negativity and the divisiveness which this text generated. But outside of that, I haven't seen any unity. Not that I can recognize. I haven't seen any unity at the organizational level. As a matter of fact, what I see is organizations actively working against one another. I have actually, though, seen glimpses of hope amongst the youth of our community, or should I say communities. And our communities are typified by a number of distinct markers. That is, we are diverse in language, we are diverse in culture. And imagine a school where these young boys and these young girls coming together from different cultural backgrounds, different ethnic backgrounds, different linguistic backgrounds, all coming together within contemporary Britain and communicating. They have been able to find a medium of communication amongst themselves which resonates with respect. So much so that my daughter brings home Zainab, who is outside of our community. Zainab doesn't speak our language, Zainab doesn't know anything about our culture, but yet still, these two girls from differing cultures, differing linguistic groups, have been able to transcend them and bring about love. Uh, they love each other, bring about love between themselves. But at a leadership level, I would challenge you to show me any examples where this is the norm. And I would be glad to see it. I'm not saying it doesn't exist. I'm saying I haven't seen it. Our communities, and they are distinct communities, need to mature. And they need to mature on a number of levels. A maturity which signals a moving away from this splendid isolation and that we are sealed off from one another and that the fate of one community doesn't directly impact the fate of our own communities. The attitude of, well, it's not happened to us, alhamdulillah, ya Allah, um, help them, but it won't happen to us, inshallah, and not offering constructive help for others within other communities unless and until we see ourselves as one community, then this call for unity, this call for a more nuanced approach to our existence here in this country, which 
in reality is hanging by a thread if you truly understand the social landscape of the United Kingdom at the present moment, as it relates to the presence of Islam and Muslims in this country, you will know our presence hangs by a thread because we have very little friends and we have been unable to leverage tools that we have, capabilities that we have that other communities have been able to leverage to insulate themselves against the onslaught which is coming thick and fast, day and night, not only from secularists, but from individuals within particular religions, monotheistic and, and others. So there needs to be a maturity. And often I turn to my children and say, when they say that uh, Fulan is on the TV, Baba, come, Fulan is on the TV, he's Muammam, come and see him. I say, okay. We listen to Fulan, and I turn to them and I say, there's one thing about book knowledge. There's another thing if you have the maturity to use that knowledge. And so the call is to the leaders in our communities that to be frank enough with oneself to understand that there are certain things they cannot grasp because of their educational backgrounds. But there are others within the community or communities who can grasp those things, who do have the spiritual, the intellectual, the emotional maturities to grasp actually what's going on and to relinquish this monolithic control, this hegemony which they've established over communities and allow others to be able to express themselves in a manner which is in line with the Quran and the Sunnah. Finally, and I do not mean in any way to take away from the joy which should be expressed openly when our ourselves, Anfusana, ourselves from the Ahlu Sunnah and ourselves from the Shia communities come together because that is beauty and we should have this on a daily basis and in fact we do we live side by side not only with non-Muslims but we live side by side either in our own countries or here with uh, our Sunni brothers and sisters they have the key to our home we have the key to their home they come in, uh, into our home and they relax and we come, go into their homes and relax. I can say that personally. I have uh, uh, neighbours from the Sunni um, Firkat. Finally, one thing which disturbs me and it has disturbed me for many years. I'm fast approaching my mid-50s and it's approached me and it's, and it's disturbed me from when I was a young boy going into the various massages both in this part of London and in other parts. And that is the acceptability of racism. The acceptability of cultural racism being the norm. And that this is not challenged. And that one group's culture regardless of what that group is, is seen to be the defining group as it relates to the expression of the Quran and the Sunnah and that all others are secondary. And so we have this nonsense that usually floats around in communities that, um, oh, all Asians are like this, all Arabs are like that, and all Africans are like this. I could be more specific, but I'm not going to be. And so we need, if we are really, truly to embrace this idea of, this reality of unity, there are a number of things we need to fix with ourselves before we ask others to fix with themselves. And one of them, as I mentioned to you, is this willing acceptance of cultural racism. It is against Islam in all forms, shapes and forms. 
So what if somebody has a different colour of skin or a different language? That is not the worth of the individual. The worth of the individual lies in their taqwa. خَيْرُ النَّاسِ أَنْفَأُهُمْ لِلنَّاسِ The best of humanity, not men and women, the best of humanity are those who bring benefit to humanity. And here in this uh, hadith from the A'imma Atar, it doesn't man mention the deen of the person. It is general. خَيْرُ النَّاسِ أَنْفَأُهُمْ لِلنَّاسِ whether Christian, Jewish, Hindu, Sikh, Buddhist, Muslim, or no faith at all. And so when we now interact with one another, if we are truly embracing the reflective paradigm of the Quran and Sunnah, we need to leave cultural racism where it belongs, in the dustbin. It doesn't belong in our centers of worship, nor should we infect our children with it. So, on that note, I'd say thank you very much once again. It's a more happy note now. Thank you once again to the uh, organisers. I know a lot of work has gone into this, and I know a lot of negativity is out there on social media, primarily uh, against AIM. But we who understand what AIM stands for not only should we support them in the words, but we should continue support them to support them in actions. Sallu ala Muhammadin wa ali Muhammad.